I went to Conway first and that's like the, where I immediately got hired. And so it was kind of crazy. Like, Oh weird. And like, I don't think we, I don't think I met you there. I, I think, no. but I definitely saw you a bunch there. You know, at that time, the shift was starting to happen a little bit, at least with some of the producers not being able to spend a lot of time at the bigger studios because the budgets were starting to get a little bit smaller. Um, yeah, I was in and out of there, but I did a lot of time there at Conway, which is one of the best studios in LA. Um, and it's still there. A lot of studios are going away. So, um, uh, I wonder, does Buddy still own that? I believe he does because I want. I was there last year working with Maroon Five, believe it or not, and he was. So he doesn't really go in as much, but he mm -hmm. um, he's there. It's his. It's his. It's his thing. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, and, and it's a great place. If if everybody doesn't know where Conway or what Conway Studios are, it's it's in uh, kind of the armpit of Hollywood on like mm -hmm. Western and um, Melrose. I think yes, or Santa yes. Monica or something That's like that. It's a little bit more down on uh, Melrose, but yeah, it's right there in that. It's almost in, in, as the kids call it now, K-Town. Uh, yeah, I lived about, -ish. yeah, I lived a couple roads over and it was considered Korea Town, yeah. But um, it's, it's like literally um, like across the streets, apartment buildings, kind of shitty. They're probably nice now because mm. uh, of gentrification, but um, uh, there's apartment buildings and then there's a car wash. And, and, uh, but uh, once you get behind the gates of Conway, it's literally like there's a, there was an old show called Fantasy Island and it was like, I think the only thing they were missing was a waterfall and a lake, but it had all this tropical vegetation. If you're working in a studio, you can look out and all you see is like banana plants, palm trees and mm -hmm. moss. And, and, and it's really cool. And they had a great staff and great equipment. And I did a lot of records there when I started um, uh, with, you know, working uh, with the, with the tuning and stuff and biz the business. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just an amazing studio. I, I love when I can get there whenever I can. So, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it's whoever, you know, whatever producer, wherever they like to work, it's, you know, some people like there or other places. And, but, uh, but then hip hop kind of came in and I remember here's a funny thing is well, hip hop's always been around for a long time, but hip hop started using these studios and they'd have these awesome, amazing tracking rooms like Conway studio C, which is like I said, literally one of the best rooms in LA. Um, and it's so funny. They would just build like a vocal booth in, 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 this massive room, which is sort of, you know, I don't know, what is it, 50 by 50 or something? It's, it's almost like a little basketball gymnasium or half a yeah. basketball gymnasium. And, it's just um, like B, yeah. Yeah, and, they, and they, would, uh, they would build a booth, and then they would, uh, they would do their, kind of their thing, and it was like, but then they'd have their entourage and their posse, and there'd be like 100 people there. And I remember going in the morning to, to set up for some session. I don't remember what it was, but – I was going in, I don't even know. Maybe it was a Saturday morning, maybe it was a Sunday morning, maybe it was a Monday morning. But like, like literally, I think they had just gotten out of there at 6 a.m. The studio was cleaned and turned around, and I was loading in at like 8. And mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it smelled, it smelled like a club. It smelled like blunts. Yep. And a little bit of, you know, which is, which is a cigar and weed. And there was a sour thing and it smelled a bit like booze. It smelled a bit like girls perfume and other mm -hmm. girl scents. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, it was crazy. And it was, it was actually, it was, it was, it was for me, nothing really bothers me, but it was, it was pretty off putting for a while. And then whoever was coming in was a pretty serious artist. I was there at 8 a.m. I think the artist was maybe going to get there at 10. And I, and I think at 10 or 11 or 12 when I left, it still was lingering. So anyway, yeah. uh, that's just I a mean, we can just turn that place around pretty quick. Like even when I was a runner there, uh, like you could turn that place around pretty quick, except for the smell. The smell, right. like sm if something like that came up and... <laughs> right. And, and if you came in sort of that era when when they were having those... those uh, those things. What's really funny is uh, somebody told me recently, uh, a friend of mine was telling me that um, it's cheaper for a rapper to go rent a studio that's two thousand dollars a day, have do, do cut some tracks or whatever, you know what I mean, vocal tracks, but then have a party than him going out to a club, red red uh, velvet roping it, private table, uh, bottle service for one night. Out, mm -hmm. out at a club, it's still cheaper doing it at the studio. 
because you're That's not paying a thousand dollars a bottle of booze or and, whatever and you know and you get your all your your entourage or whatnot like oh i'm in the studio like it's, yeah. it's a big atmosphere thing in fact after i was kind of let go from conway i went to resonate which is right next door to ocean which is when i kind of met you for real and mm -hmm. uh that i was involved in like i had so many engineering sessions with that kind of stuff and right some of it was fun and other of most of it was annoying because they'd be like, Oh, Smitty, I want you here at like noon. And I'm like, okay, I know you're not coming in till 9 PM. And so I'd literally come in and it got so bad to where I'd come in and I'd sleep there from noon till nine and they'd sure. come in, wake up. And then they would be like, Hey, we're going to, you know, they, they'd say, Hey, here, you know, download all this, these tracks or whatever. And then we're going to go out to the club for a while. And then they come back from the club with a giant entourage. And I don't know, right. have you been inside resonate? No, you know what? I, I might have went in there briefly, but I don't even, I always just thought it was a mixing place that Chris Lord Algy, kind of, the yeah. king of, of uh, the world, um, had for a while and worked out of. But um, uh, no, I, I, I've only seen it but because of parking, mm -hmm. just maybe in front of the driveway almost sometimes. Um, the inside but, looks really sexy at nighttime. Like it looks right. really nice. It looks is there, like. Is there a tracking room? Yeah, there's two mixing? small rooms in each studio. Right. Uh, so it's more of an room, overdub mix. Yeah, which you know that was either hip hop stuff or was Disney stuff. So right. like they'd have you know Disney kids come in and sing whatever song was going to be on their TV show or movie or whatever it was, and then on the other room at nighttime we'd be doing hip hop stuff. So it was like right. it was a crazy, crazy atmosphere. But yeah, I I definitely got thrown into that kind of era of. Oh, we're gonna rent out all these studios, and they would go. They would go around like renting out and spend about sixty grand, and then they wouldn't. They wouldn't pay them, and then they go to another studio. So, like, I remember Resonate almost got stiffed once because because of that kind of stuff. I'm I'm blanking on the name of the studio. It's out in the valley, and um, Chris Lordology moved his whole operation to it. Yeah, and and um, and also Mike Elizondo had a room there. There's two studios, and I, I can't think of the name right now. I'm blanking, but um, um, I remember, yeah, I remember our friend Jerry Finn. I mean, Jerry was still alive when you were working there, right? Yes. Okay. So um, I remember Jerry. Oh God, I, it's not. I can't think of this name. I can't think of what the name of the studio is. Anyways, but I remember Jerry was when he, one of his first sessions was at that studio um, out in the valley, and uh, I remember it was a hip hop session. And, um, basically a hip hop session is basically like two faders and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was early hip hop when they were doing it to tape and all this stuff. It was like an all night thing. And Jerry, as an assistant engineer on a session is to, at the end of the night, the producer signs the, the document or the receipt saying it was this much money, everything, you know, whatever the room was this and whatever. And it's, you sign it and it gets, goes to the record company or whatever. And, um, and, or they pay for it there or then. And the guy, the rapper, whoever it was, pulled the gun on him and said, Ooh. we ain't signing this. Give us our tapes. And Jerry said, here's your tapes, sir. Here you go. And it was just like, you know what I mean? It's like, he was like, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna, you know what I mean? Basically, I'm not going to lose. And he's I'm still not gonna, assistant. I'm sure getting assistant pay at that point. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. But even if you were, even if you were a producer or, or whatever, yeah. if somebody says a gun says, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to take my tapes now with the posse and whatever. Well, there you go, sir. Here's your tapes. Yeah. But then he shortly after that moved into Conway, started working as assistant and then his career sort of took off from there. But, um, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So I, that was just <laughs> the rap session, uh, whatever. But, um, yeah, it's so it's 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 interesting versus bands and stuff. I remember. Wait, one more story of a quick quick thing. There's a studio in sure. Burbank called. See, I can't remember the name, but it was they were doing the music for a South Park movie, mm -hmm. the big movie they did with Terrence and whoever in the movie, the characters. Um, and uh, I remember going into track drums with my friend Matt Log, who's a session drummer for for Trey and and Matt, the the, the creators. Um, and he did like the song, what would boy Brian Boitano do? I don't know. I mean, and, um, whatever and it was this movie anyways, but I remember going in there to set up drums, all the assistants from the other rooms came. And I think there was a couple or two or three other rooms cause they had not done drums since these kids got out of school and were working out too. Cause it was all rap or hip hop sessions, which everything was programmed in like I said, two faders. 
So all these yeah. kids were fascinated because they had taken the class about recording, but never saw drums actually being recorded. So, so, uh, so it was kind of funny. So all these kids were in there and we did these songs and for this movie, whatever it was, Team America. Does that sound right? Oh, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Oh, whatever. Right. It's with the marionettes, so anyway, so, right? <laughs> what? It's with the marionettes? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, but I met the South Park, Park guys, whatever. They were cool. I was, I was um, familiar with the show and whatever. That's the other thing, too. It's like weird. When you're hustling and working to the next gig, to the next thing, to the next thing. It's it, this was pre TiVo or or DVRs. Um, like I, I missed so many. Like I missed all of Friends. I, I apparently Friends was a very popular show. <laughs> that's awesome. But so, just for everybody that's listening, uh, I want to kind of just go over quickly, like how you got started and what you're in. I definitely don't want to like. I know everybody probably probably hounds you about friggin' Guns and Roses and Warrant and whatnot, but maybe just give a, a quick deal of how you got started in the music industry in general. Um, to make a long story as short as possible. I, um, my, really my, my, first of all, I played drums. That was my thing. I wanted to be in Motley Crue or rap when I was growing up. Those were my bands and, um, and, or the cure. Um, mm. so I have this, this thing, but, um, but, um, uh, I played drums and I was, uh, I, I had, I had met a friend, um, when I, when I worked at a music store, his name was, oh, sorry, I met Matt Sorum when, uh, I was rehearsing in a country band at a rehearsal studio that he lived above in Burbank. Um, and he was super cool. He, he was running the sound. He played in the band with the guy who owned the, the studio. So we became friends. I worked at a little music store up the street. Um, I lived with my mom. I mean, I was like, 20 and uh, I lived with my mom up the street. He lived in the rehearsal studio. We would rehearse there. He was cool. Um, we, I don't know. We just kind of struck it up. He said, Hey man, I'm playing at this place. Come see me play. He was a great drummer. Great guy. Had him over the house, fed him. He had no money. Um, and then one day he walked into the music store and he said, I just auditioned for this band called the cult and I got the gig and we're going on tour. And I said, I've heard of the cult. They have this, this record called love and there's a record called Electric. And he goes, well, yeah, they have a new record coming out called Sonic Temple. I'm going to go on this tour. I go, I go, Matt, I go, this is going to be huge for you. They're, they're really a big band. And, and, uh, and not, maybe not a lot of people knew about him. And, uh, but I knew enough about him because I was a fan mm. of, of the cult. And um, so, so anyways, he um, we went on tour with the cult. Um, he, the last two cult shows it, we're in, in los angeles i went to the shows that's where guns and roses saw him with the cult and and mm -hmm. steven adler the drummer at the time of guns and roses was in rehab and they had to do a song for for a movie soundtrack so anyways turns out that um matt does the song um they ask him to start rehearsing for user illusion records one and two and uh he said, uh, he, he does it. They start doing it a couple months later. They said, Hey, we really love you. Live your plan. We want you to be in the band. So this is the, he gets this, this incredible break. Amazing drummer des deserves it. This is pre YouTube where you could search a guy to be the singer or jury on YouTube or a drummer or, or some five-year-old that can play better than all of us Boy or a girl drummer and could be in any of the bands that are touring now. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, technically be, be in the band. Um, there's a lot more, to being in a band than just being a great drummer. But, um, so anyway, so, um, uh, got in guns and, um, did the records. And then I had, a, I played drums on Princess Cruises and I was in a lounge and a cocktail band and I was going on the road uh, on the, on the, the high seas, the seven seas with this thing. And I said, Hey, I have this, this snare drum. It's my Tama candy apple red, uh, 1980, six snare drum i said you should use this when you record use your illusions one and two or whatever whatever they were called you know we were, mm. it's a great rock snare drum great ballad snare drum whatever and uh so he i gave him that to use he gave me a little cd 700 piccolo jazz snare drum because i was playing cocktail music with tuxedos and goofy sequin ties and stuff like that <laughs> and um and um on a ship for three months because that's what the contracts were so when i came back from the three months um he said hey man you know do you want to 
we're going on tour with Guns N' Roses. Do you want to, um, would you want to be my roommate? So I was Matt's roommate. Um, and I paid him three fifty a week. We lived in one of Duff's houses in Laurel Canyon. And, uh, and, um, we, uh, he, he, you know, he'd go on the road. I'd watch his girlfriend. I'd water the lawn. I'd take the trash out. I'd whatever. Somebody, I guess, be, be with his girlfriend, Lisa. At the time. And, um, so uh, one day he came back from the tour and he, and I was working at a music store at that time. And I was playing in top 40 bands, country bands, um, uh, wedding bands, whatever, 50 bucks a night, 150 bucks, hundred dollars, whatever. But I worked at a music store. So I had my hands on musical gear. Uh, my friend Scott and my friend Bruce, Scott Mundy and Bruce Jacoby taught me how to tune um, drums, and but but I knew about sticks heads and all this stuff. So, but I knew Matt's setup. So one day he came home and said, "We we, we got to go in the studio." My drum tech Timmy Doyle is in Texas. His wife's having a baby. We got to go in the studio this week and finish this um, Spaghetti Incident record. So Spaghetti Incident re- record was a cover record that they did. So I'd never been in the studio, but I knew Matt's setup. Went in, set up. Um, tuned because I knew how to tune. Um, and, uh, um, I, I took time off of work to do this a week off of work at the music store, which I worked 60 hours a week, made $140. Uh, they were always threatening to find me, fire me. Cause I, my, my handwriting was sloppy and whatever. Um, so, <laughs> like that so really it's, it's, all, it's all a, it's all a back backstory, but it, it all, it all plays into falling into this studio session. Work with Mike Clink. He's the producer. Um, I went in there, Mike, said to me, where's Big Red? Where's Big Red? And um, I was like, he's not here. I don't think he's supposed to be here till later. Uh, but but I, I, why are you asking me? He goes, no, Big Red, the snare drum, the Big Red snare drum we used on Use Your Illusions and the, you know, the records, whatever. My snare drum was like, oh, I, they, they used to call, the Guns N' Roses guys used to call Axel Big Red, mm-hmm. um, who was the singer because he had red hair of Guns N' Roses. Anyway, so, I knew how to tune. It kind of fell into it. My first session was Guns N' Roses in the studio. Matt said to me, you were great. I'm going to do sessions until Guns N' Roses goes on the road again. And you can be my guy. Turns out we did Slash's Snake Pit record. And then um, when I met Jerry Finn at Conway and Slash's Snake Pit, and he was the assistant engineer, he hired me for a band called The Muffs. We did The Muffs, Blonder and Broader. So basically... Um, I went from Guns N' Roses to to then Green Day because I met Rob Cavallo doing the Muffs within six months. Whether I was good at tuning, bad at tuning, ugly at tuning, whatever, I had this opportunity. So I worked from Guns N' Roses to Green Day in six months, but I did know what I was doing. I knew how to tune drums. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about room sound. I didn't know about um, reverb. I didn't know about plates. I didn't know about... I just tried to make the drum sound as open and big as possible at the source. Yeah. So that was something that I remember Jerry Finn was saying, man, I, he goes, your toms sound amazing. I don't have to EQ them. And I, and I was like, cool. Is that, I go, is that good? <laughs> Cause I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything mm-hmm. about that. I just knew like almost a caveman. Here's a drum and here's how to make it sound as good as possible for some reason. And I kind of fell into it. And, and then Matt did a few more sessions. I went from working with Rob on Green Day to other bands. Um, and I just kind of fell into it. And then a couple of years later, Trey said to me, I found a couple of snare drums for Trey and he bought them. And uh, he said, you know, you should be buying these things because if we come to town and I need a piccolo snare drum, that's this piccolo, this noble and cooly piccolo, you'll have it and we can rent it from you. And I was like, yeah. huh? And there's other companies um, doing a couple of other guys in town doing it. And they were the first guys in town really having the drum tuning cartridge companies. And yeah. I had no idea. Like, you know, I just sort of whatever. I just knew how to make the drum sound good in the area. But I also, because I play drums, which some people only know me as working in the studio. And some people only know me as being a drummer, which is great. I have two separate things. Um, because I play drums, I know if a cymbal angle's wrong, or if I know a ride cymbal, if they're doing a crash ride part on a very pingy ride cymbal, it's very obvious mm-hmm. that it's going to be too clanky, so find another lighter, smoother ride, and then maybe I'll tell the drummer, not Matt Sorum, but 
a kid drummer that with some of these new punk bands that we're, I was starting to work with, we'll play the shoulder of it. It'll wash the ride cymbal up a little bit more. If you need more eighth note definition, we'll put a heavy, heavier ride. Or sometimes we, like Cyrus from Newfound Glory, we had a heavier ride and a, and a sweeter uh, ride to wash on. He eventually, he did that for a while, but then eventually found something he could get both out of in weight of, yeah. that, instead of having two rides. But anyway, so m my understanding of playing drums, because I play drums, I understood, it was like an extra thing. I wasn't just a guy that could tune drums. I wasn't just a guy that just dropped off drums and here they are. Well, they worked for this band, so they should work for you. I was never that guy. It was, it was like always detailed to who the artist was and what the thing was and whatever. And I amassed a collection of drums. So I have a collection of drums. I have over 200 snare drums. So I have, you know, a hundred okay. drum kits or so. Um, where do you keep all of them? <laughs> I have, I have a storage, uh, facility at mates where I have a drum room that I, I, I share with my friend, Matt log, who's a session drummer. And then just down the hall, I have a couple of lockers of drums and stuff. Um, and, and you know, it's cool. It's, it's great to come home. We have a, my wife plays drums too. And we have an electric drum set here. It's great not to have all the noise here. So there's no real drums yeah. here, um, which is great to get away from it. And then it's great to go somewhere and that's a dedicated area. So, so anyway, so that was it, but I've always played in bands and I've always done stuff. And I, I managed to have my, my, my rental, um, tuning business over the last 20 years. And I've worked with everybody from Fleetwood Mac to, uh, Nine Inch Nails and everybody in between. And, um, um, but I've always been playing and I've always been whatever. And I've had a couple of friends of mine sub for me if I was on the road. When I was playing drums in a band called Warrant, um, my friend Garner would sub for me on some of these sessions. I remember um, doing an AFI record with Butch Vig and Jerry Finn. Uh, they were both co-producing the record. I remember um, I was I, um, I'd picked the drums. They had to go on tour with Warrant and the tour was going to be about a month. But we had this weird like three day break where I flew home for three days, literally from the airport to the studio for AFI a week or a few days into the studio, just to check up, give Garner a break, just to check up. Cause I couldn't sit in a hotel room for three days yeah. and, and worry about the session. I always really worried about the sessions and I, and I also put so much of my life into the sessions when I could, but I also, as a drummer, wh why, as a drummer, I still wanted to have the opportunities to play. So I wanted to kind of do both as best as I could. And I think I did as best as I could and still am as best as I could. Now I'm in Tiger mm -hmm. Army again. And uh, obviously nobody's doing anything, not even recording or touring or anything now. Yeah. It'll, it'll be a while, but, but I still was managing to juggle things. And I have a couple of guys I can rely on to help me. And the company that I store at and use mates, Cartage and Storage in North Hollywood are fantastic. I have, you know, those guys that to, to help at any time, you know, um, I remember, um, I was on tour in September and this, um, Maroon five session finished and, um, that finished, I was going to be home a few days later and I thought it might work out. It didn't. And I, I called mates. I said, they got to get the drums out of there tomorrow by 8am at Conway and there were Conway mm. and I said, no problem. They sent a guy down there who wasn't a drummer. I forget what his name is. And he packed up the drums better than any drum tech guy I have uh, and put them away. And there was a lot of drums. There were a couple of drum kits and 10 snare drums and whatever, you know, whatever. But, uh, but so um, it was great. So, um, but those guys helped help me, but I am a one man show with, with the business. I mean, it's just me. I prep the stuff. I pull the stuff. I, I, you know, it's just whatever, but that's just, that's the only way I know it. I never worked for any of the, other companies in town. I just, like I said, I came out of a music store situation where I knew gear and what it could do and drum heads and sticks and cymbals and hardware and so many elements to building a kit. Um, I was just never one to just drop off drums and go. I just, I would always, I always looked at it as if I was getting a rental kit on the road, which I have a lot with, with um, Tiger Army when we're touring, I would want it to be the best it could be if uh, I would, I, when I'm giving somebody set, setting a kid up, I want to give options. I want to make it right. I want to have the hardware work. I want to have everything be as if it was for me. Yeah. And you know what? Maybe that's the Italian mother in me. You know what I mean? Like mm. caring, but that's, 
you know, if I get anything from, from my mom, Olympia, that's what I get. And it's just really important. And, and, um, it's I remember, not man, about, when you brought in that giant box of like snares, I was like, right. holy crap. Like, I thought you were just going to like, like, uh, bring in, like, I think, I think you'd brought in a grudge kit or something. And, uh, like we talked about prior, like, Hey, I'm kind of going for this so- sound or that sound. And you're like, I got something perfect for that. And you brought in, brought in the right. kit, but then you also brought in this giant thing of, of snares. You're like, Oh, I thought you were just going to bring like a couple of snares and it was well, great to go but, through them. But here's the, here's the thing. We were having drums carted in the truck. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's the whole thing is I don't nickel and dime everybody. Yeah. Ken snare drums were there, but it was all for the price of the drum kit. Because the reality is we used one or two of them. I don't forget how many tracks we yeah. did. But, or, or three of them, maybe. <laughs> but if we were on the session and I thought, oh, my gosh, this snare drum would be great. Then I've got to leave the session or have somebody bring it or whatever. And it's just those were the usual suspects that I know could fill a gap of what you told me. The drums were the whatever. The cymbal bags were the whatever. That's what it is. It's like um, it's, it's just tools for me to make it efficient for you. Mm. If I have my tools there, which is drums, then I can make it happen for you. And that's what I that's what I kind of did. But that's me playing understanding music understanding the culture of 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 the attitude of what the band's trying to do whatever that's it i mean like listen i have no desire to rent guitars or bass amps or guitar amps or i don't know anything about i don't want to be an engineer i don't care about microphones because you know what i've been fortunate enough to work with great guys like you and 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 whoever else i've worked with that that's what they do but when you try to be a jack of all trades like i've worked i know a uh, a producer friend um, who hired me a couple of times to do some stuff. And then I guess he, f- he's figured it out. He's unlocked the mystery of tuning and getting a drum sound and all this stuff. And I've never been hired again, oh, but <laughs> every day I learn I'm doing this thing for my friend, Matt Sorum. And uh, he, tonight I, 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 I'm, I'm, there's a stream, save the stages. Um, he said, look at, there's no money. Can you help me out? Whatever. He said, just bring a small kit, whatever. He plays Gretsch drums. I play Gretsch drums. I have a great vintage kit. I pulled this kit out three days ago. I, I did some stuff. It's new to me, this vintage kit. And I, uh, I realized I heard some buzzing. I thought, oh, maybe it's the floor tom legs. And I put some, some foam. Sometimes the floor tom legs on all drums touch the rims and they buzz a little bit. Mm-hmm. I thought, oh, no. Okay, I did that. And it's still buzzing. And I said, well, this is a vintage drum. I better get in there, take the heads off, take each lug off. There's springs that push up the lug casing unit that the tension rod goes in. Take the two screws out, pull the thing off. Okay, the springs are rattled in these vintage drums. So what you do is you pull the spring out, you put a piece of felt underneath the spring, it sort of wraps the spring, so it will never vibrate. So I spent three hours going through two tom-toms and a kick drum and a snare drum putting packing the lugs because I didn't want this thing buzzing on this, on this video thing, which is really a session in a way it's a live performance, but it's sort of a session, but everybody's streaming shows. So that's what I did yesterday because I care because I wouldn't want to be on the session and having something buzz. And, and you know how recording is it's under the microscope. Every you, everybody, Oh, it's just drums. It's just, they're just noisy, but you have, sometimes two or three kick drum mics. You have a sometimes top and bottom Tom head. Sometimes you have two or three mics on the snare, a couple of overheads, a couple of close mics, a couple of room mics. Um, if you have the luxury and I'll tell you all that stuff is becomes more apparent. Yes. In the big picture of the whole sound, you might not hear it, but you know what? I know it. I know what the problem is and I can't let those drums go out. I spent three hours dealing with that yesterday. I've definitely had what things. I have. And now I have another one, another kit. I'm going to, as soon as I'm going to do that next week, I'm going to do it to the other kit of mm-hmm. that, that era. These, I got these two old vintage round batch kits. Um, and so, um, but it was apparent to me. So, and it was like, I got to do this. I got to make it right. That I, I just, I don't know. And I don't think I'm OCD or, or ADD or whatever, or, or I'm not like that, but something I'm real basic. It's either right or it's wrong. And uh, I want to make it right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I mean, it's a it's professionalism. I mean, it's, I I someone who kept trying to hire me for lower and lower. Like, well, only, you only have to do this. You only have to do this. And here, okay, here's this little smart part, and I'm gonna pay you this little amount. And like, listen, like the pay isn't the problem to me. The problem is you're gonna like, oh, my buddy Josh worked on this thing, and it's gonna get worse and worse and worse, and quality wise, like. 
like I when I jump into this stuff, I want it to be amazing. So like the I'd rather you not pay me at all and me be in, involved in a ton of it to make sure that it sounds good rather than I'm just hiring my my friend Josh here to either just do a quick mix or vocal tuning or whatever it is. Like it was yeah, just professionalism trying to make sure that it's amazing even if it's, you know, you're not doing a lot or or you know whatever. Not right. supposed to do a lot, yeah. For example, the band we work with, Surrender Radio. Whether it's Surrender Radio or Guns N' Roses or Nine Inch Nails or the door knob band that's brand new that has no budget, um, I'm doing something. I just, I just can't, I can't not do it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if it, you're a big band or a little band. I'm still going to do what I do. And there's no whatever. Sometimes you, you got to cut your, your losses beca- uh, for things. Sometimes I have to go on sessions and there's there, a lot of times there's a house kit or something. And, and I'll be completely honest. I would never say, well, this is horrible. Like some of the other companies do. Oh, this, you've got to order this stretch kit. And it's going to cost you whatever when they have no money. I, mm-hmm. I say, look, this is the, here's your kit. This is the best I can make it. There's yeah. a problem with this, Tom. This is what the problem is. So maybe you can add a little bit more reverb to it, or maybe you can EQ it or whatever. But these three toms sound good, but this one, I, I've tried everything. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. That's honest. It's like, like, not like, oh, it's not my kit, whatever. So, um, and it's a budget thing. You know what I mean? There's, you know, it's, it's, it's whatever. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's like you said, you got to deal with what you got to deal with and, and do the best you can. But I never, I just, I just, it's not in me to phone it in. It's not in me to, um, to whatever. But, but I'll, if somebody's not, if, I mean, I could, I mean, people say, what's your favorite session? Who's your favorite person to work for? You know what I can tell you? I can tell you the couple of people I don't ever want to work for. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Because, because they don't value you or, or, or they don't see what your value is. And it's not even about, like I'm doing this thing for SOAR today for free. But I, but I am showing up. I have spent out a few hours prepping this kit, so it's right. It is Billy Gibbons tonight. It is Macy Gray. I will be, I'm there. And who knows what, it will turn up or nothing. But Matt is my old roommate. Mm-hmm. He's done me a couple favors. I've done him many favors. But his <laughs> couple favors have given me a career in, yeah. in, in the business. Or a so-called career. Or, or, or whatever this is, a slow news day having me on your podcast. Oh, gosh, no. In so, fact, uh, the couple of people that I was talking to, a couple other my friends this week, and I was like, oh, I'm having Mike Fasano on this weekend. And they're like, Mike Fasano, oh, that's amazing. You should ask him about blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's great. <laughs> like, just tons and tons of stuff. Because, I mean, you've worked with Green Day. I mean, like, I got a list here of stuff that, like, just tickles my fancy. But, like, your list is just insane, especially for the drum technician stuff. Green Day, Amberlin, Newfound Glory, Bad Religion, My Chemical Romance, Weezer, Rancid, Blink-182, Fall Out Boy. Just, it just goes on and on and on. I mean, it's it's insane. Yeah, I was really lucky. I, I When I started, like I said, it's funny. It was the end of Guns N' Roses in their heyday because they never did anything for, I don't know, 15 years after that. Yeah. They never really, they never did it with the band with Matt Sorum. I mean, Axel had his Guns N' Roses and then he brought everybody back. But um, um, I was very fortunate. Like I said, the second session with Matt was Slash the Snake Pit at Conway. Jerry Finn was the assistant engineer at Conway. And I didn't know what, my dad was a carpenter for movie studios, right? And he worked on shows like Happy Days and, and he worked at all the studios and whatever. And he was a carpenter, right? So I knew the director of a movie was the director who, who kind of was like a producer. I knew that the cameraman was the guy like an engineer recording everything. You know what I mean? I knew that. But when, when, when I met Jerry and he was just the guy putting microphones around the kit um, and after that, I think we did it. It was like a two week session at, at, at Conway. Um, and that was the first time I ever did cocaine with, uh, Matt storm slash the Coke dealer, Jerry Finn in studio C lounge. (laughs) First time I ever did cocaine, just a little side. You can keep it in there. And, um, (laughs) and, uh, but Jerry at, at the end of the session, he said, um, to me, he said, I'm working with a band called the muffs. And I'm the engineer, and, and I, I really like how your drum sounded. I like, really like what you did. 
and he said, are you available to work on a Muffs record with me in a couple of weeks at this studio, NRG in North Hollywood? Mm -hmm. And uh, Rob Cavallo is producing it. I was like, oh, that's cool. He did, a, uh, uh, he produced a band called Green Day and I mixed Green Day and I was like, wait a minute. Green Day, I just saw Green Day on MTV at like two in the morning, high on Coke, because I had just partied, right? Um, it was, at, you know, after, you know, after seeing Jerry, uh, and um, I thought to myself, um, oh, and I'm so glad I'm past the drug days, by the way. I'm, I'm not sober, but I'm not, I'm not, whatever, partying, <laughs> like, like, I mean, I may have a couple of beers and it's like a good time now. But uh, it was weird. I saw this band, and I think it was the first long view where Billy's uh, chopping up the couch, and, and it was very vivid in color, and it sounded amazing. You could hear all the drums. And then Jerry said, well, I mixed that. And I said, I said you mixed that? What does that mean? It goes, oh, I, I balance all the sounds, and it's, it's a mix. It's, you know, you record stuff, and then you have to go. I was like, I, like, I had no clue. Like I said, all I ever wanted to be was Bobby Blotzer or, or Tommy Lee, in a in a in a in an eighties rock band. That's where I came from, um, or B Boris from The Cure. Um, I didn't know anything about any of that stuff. So mm. it was weird. But I knew how to tune drums and get them to then eventually really get them to to translate from the room with a little bit of dampening or muting or this or that or yeah. hello or this or whatever or the right snare drum or the right ride symbol or the right whatever. It all came next naturally i just like literally fell into it with no instruction never once I, I i learned i just i learned i don't know just like fell into it it's just crazy so i was very fortunate because because of jerry finn bringing me to rob caballo and then jerry and rob did a few records that was like google all next and then shortly after that we're doing like rancid with jerry in uh in in uh fantasy studios and then we're doing pennywise and then we're doing um you know uh all these bands i mean you know whatever i just gotta look around but <laughs> you know and he jerry went from an assistant engineer because he mixed dookie but still went back to being an assistant engineer because he was an assistant engineer at devonshire they didn't like the mixes they went on a dinner break rob Paul said could you get a mix up for this the mix was better, and they said, can you mix this other thing? So Jerry fell into it, then went back to assisting, then got hired by Rob as his engineer for a few records, like maybe a year. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a year and a half, and then, he, then Jerry was on his own. But because of Jerry always cheerleading for me because we were friends and we goofed off and we were just always laughing about stuff, but yet still doing our job, which mm -hmm. was to make – everybody comfortable and make the best sounding records we could. Jerry, I mean, I had a great, I had a great run of those bands, but mm -hmm. it wasn't just the pop punk bands. It was like Stevie Nicks and it was other bands. It was, you know, Fleetwood Mac. It was, you know, I, I did do, I, so I didn't, thank God I didn't just get pigeonholed. And, and, uh, and that's why then I started on amassing my collection. I have drums for, you know, a lot of things. You know what I mean? I have enough stuff yeah. to make. <laughs> I have enough. Happen. Like, uh, before, before we move on, like I want to hit, I mean, on the Jerry thing, like you said, oh, I got enough this or that. I remember when he would come in to Conway, he had tons and tons and tons of them, like amazing guitars. It was insane. I didn't even know. I didn't even know he would be there to be honest. He's the reason like kind of why I got into like wanting to be a mixer and a recording engineer and a producer. And I, I chose Conway because I'd read in some book like, oh, he assisted at Conway. Well, maybe I right. could start assisting at Conway or something. And so like, and there it was basically like, yeah, sure, show up on this date. And so I moved from Indiana out right. here, and uh, it was crazy. Like, I only got to meet him a couple times. Right. And like at Conway, it's kind of like a militant environment, kind of for the runners and whatnot. Like, if you don't do things right, like you're gone. Like right. you're just straight up gone. And while that's still that there's a little bit of like that at all the other studios that I've, I've worked at, I feel like that one's very much like that to where like, we need this. Don't talk to anybody. Don't do this or that. Like, you know, Britney Spears was there, like back sure. there, like all this other crazy stuff. But like when Jerry showed up, I said, oh, this is amazing. I can't talk to him or whatever. He literally like found out my name and like walked mm -hmm. up to me. And after a session one night, he's like, hey, Josh, right? Hey, blah, blah, blah. Just started talking to me. I'm like, 
yeah, dude. Oh, cool. And like we sat there and talking for like five, ten minutes. And it was like it was the nicest thing anybody had done to me in L.A. Like and to be honest, even even up to this date, like that's probably one of the nicest things that anybody's ever done to me in a studio environment because, you know, you got egos and everything else running around. But like, you know, he took a time like his huge producer took a time out of like his day to just chit chat with me a couple times to and, you know, treat me like an actual person. And like when he wouldn't eat, when he would eat in the lounge, you know, we're supposed to like run in and rush out and clean everything out real quick. And he would be doing his dishes. And I'm like, hey, dude, I'll take that. And he's like, no, you know, I, I work this place forever. I'm going to do my own dishes, dude. It's totally fine. So like, it was just such a crazy like stand up thing for that guy. And like, I didn't meet him a million times, but like just, just meeting him those few times and what he tried to do like that time, it really kind of touched me. It's kind of, it was kind of crazy. And it sucks because not only is he gone, does it sucks? But, you know, all these producers and everything nowadays, you can see videos and videos and videos of them everywhere. And there's interviews all over the place. Some of them have podcasts. There's like nothing for Jerry. Nothing. There's and like that just one as, book. Just as he would like it. I don't even know what that book is. But um, there are very rare, 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 rare photos. Um, he wasn't really into it. Um, you know, the cool thing about Jerry, like you said about all his guitars, you know what's rad about Jerry? Jerry would get like, oh, I got this uh, 56 Strat and it's the... Um, it's got this pickup. It's this right strat, and it, and it was like a hundred thousand dollars. And um, he would be like, "I really want to do a shootout on it to see if, if we could use it on something." He would never come in like, "I'm rad. Look at my rad guitar. You have to play it on this part." That's mm -hmm. what that was great about Jerry. Um, it was all about that. It, where where a lot of producers are into the fame and the whole thing, and and uh, and and the whatever. And it's just like I remember I was working with. My Chemical Romance, and it was with uh, Brendan O'Brien, and it was at A and M Studios, which is called Henson. And uh, Brendan O'Brien, um, Dave Grohl was was at the studio and came in, and Brendan O'Brien had a couple of these um, blue um, Gibson guitars. They're blue. It's a certain blue that Dave is really fond of, or whatever. And Brendan O'Brien had a bunch of gear and. I just remember Dave kind of going in and looking at the guitars and like, Oh, that's cool. And this and that. And then Brendan, like Dave left and Brendan was like, what the fuck, man? He couldn't even give it up. I have like these rad guitars and I have these guitars that he's really into. And, like, he's just like, well, oh, that's cool. It's like, <laughs> if you're Brendan, we wanted like Dave to get all fucking whatever about his guitars. It's like, that's fucking just silly. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a control thing. There's a hierarchy. There's, Thing. I mean that that coming out of the seventies and, and eighties maybe, and I think I think Jerry probably got a little bit shit on by people as he started, but and his transition happened so quick that he wasn't going to ever shit on anybody. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? There's only a couple of people he didn't like, Jerry, and yeah. and uh, and for obvious reasons and um, whatever. But um, yeah, he was a good dude. I mean, we could talk fuck forever just about Jerry Finn. I mean, that's that's a completely yeah. other show he's he's great and you know it's, what's funny is um this is like the the month of sadness because month and a half of sadness because he he is in the midst of the um uh, uh his, his hospital on life support um uh time right now because he 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 passed you know he passed away you seen a, you know 11 years ago or so um the anniversary is coming up in about a week so um, so yeah, he's, he's on my mind, but yeah, we, Jerry really, you know, if it really wasn't for Jerry, I don't think, first of all, I mean, yes, it's all Jerry, but if I didn't have the ability to understand music or drums or this and that, or have, have a, have an ethic on wanting to make it right and not take advantage of somebody with a rental, you know, or, or, or a price and doing something today, still today I'm doing stuff for free. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, yeah. for Matt, for a charity thing, but you know, it, it'll, something will come of it. You know what I mean? Uh, eventually. Um, yeah. and that's just the way it is. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I had a great run and it was because of Jerry Finn, but I also, it's like, okay, basically, you know, but you could be out just as fast. Eventually it'll catch up yeah. to you if you're not, if you don't have the ability to do it. And uh, going back to runners, Mike Klink, one of the greatest things he's ever said, besides producing Guns N' Roses Appetite, Spaghetti Incident, Usual Illusions 1 and 2, 
one of the greatest things he ever said to me, your studio is only as good as its runner. Because back in the day when there was no internet, you'd look up, if somebody wanted a black candle that was nine inches long and two inches in diameter, you had guys calling. It's like, it, you, you know, you don't say no, because if that's going to make the artist happy, then that's mm-hmm. going to make the artist happy. Also, yeah. um, as a runner, the more efficient you are, when you start engineering and then eventually producing, and you know somebody's going out for a black two-inch candle with, you know, nine inches in height, and it takes them four hours to get when it should only take 45 minutes, then you know something's wrong because it's, it's, it's deterring your session. So somebody told me, I worked for this guy, Larry Larson, at Larry Larson Music Store here in Glendale. That said, Larry passed away a few years ago, but at 15, I worked at his music store. And um, he told me, he taught me how to open a box. He taught me how to clean a toilet. He taught me how to lock the place up. He ca- taught me how to cl- count a dr- drawer out. He said, we know, so when you get in here and you're cleaning this toilet, you get down on your hands and knees and you grit your teeth and you clean it the best you can clean it. Because someday you could be escorting the president of the United States or somebody of major statue, stature and you're going to do it right. Mm-hmm. And there's just an ethic. So it's just all about putting, putting ethic and, and heart into it. And, and, you know, a lot of times I grit my teeth when I'm doing something. And my wife laughs at me and she she sneaks pictures of me. And I said, I said, listen, honey, I know I don't call her honey. I said, listen, you, I said, you better, you better start worrying when I don't grit my teeth. Cause that means I don't give, give a shit anymore. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if I'm gritting my teeth and putting it into it, then I'm into it. But if I'm not, then you better start worrying. That's so. something that I definitely took from, from Conway when uh, I was at a couple other little tiny studios and then I went to resonate and I was there probably for five or so years. And when I went there, like I was the most efficient guy there. Um, I know at Conway, they kind of taught you to like do the, the little toilet paper at the end thing yeah, and all sure. these other, just a little tiny things. Like and, like, I remember, yeah, the receptionist there was like, just amazed. Like, Oh wow. Everything's clean. Everything's whatever. And like some of the other kids were just super lazy. And I've, I've even worked at other studios where I'm like, Come on, dude. We need this to get this done. It's just kind of, yeah. I would be on sessions because I'm the first guy there. Um, and I would set up and I would make small talk with the runners that were sweeping or setting up tables or doing whatever. And you know, what's funny is I had a real quick knack of the guys that were proactive and were going to be around doing it and the guys that weren't going to make it because yeah. of of just talking to them and then sort of just observing them working. Because if I had an opportunity, if a studio needed a runner and I saw this kid at eight in the morning that was cool and was positive and jumping, he's, he's um, not a, he's a runner. So he's not even getting paid. He's mm-hmm. it's a, what do they call it? A uh, apprentice well, internship. Uh, yeah. Internship. So, yeah. um, and somebody needs a, a good guy. I'm going to get this guy who's not getting paid to a better studio that's going to get him paid as, as a runner. So, and not, not an intern. So, um, and I could see it, you know, and I tried to help guys out when I could, you know, and I was just always whatever. Um, yeah. And you know, what's funny is those guys became engineers and producers and would eventually four or five or six years, years later, remember me and said, well, let's get Mike to work on this. He's got drums and you know, so whatever it's, it's kind of thing in this business. If you're putting a team together, you want to get the guys you, you know and trust and rely on because you can't be late. You can't smell bad or do bad work or whatever. You have to be on your game because it's, it's just a specialized business in a way. So mm-hmm. Definitely. So I was and- fortunate and, and now everything's changed and, and, and whatever. And I'm still working and, and uh, still doing it, but just differently now. So. Yeah. One of the main questions that I kind of wanted to hit eventually was, you know, how are you dealing with the COVID stuff and how's Tiger Army dealing with it? I know that that in like, was it March or whatever? Uh, basically, everything was canceled with the exception of think what one the shows in October. And I mean, it's, it's just crazy. Like, how is how are you guys dealing with that just in general? Well, unfortunately, the COVID has stopped the world. And everything is going to be stopped for a lot longer than any, anything, anything that we know, meaning it's not going to be happening. I I don't, I mean, we need to find a cure to this, this virus. 
we also need to to, to find a um, a cure for inequality, you know, Black Lives Matter and all that stuff. So there's a lot of stuff happening right now. Um, we were literally one of the last bands to postpone because this COVID thing was starting to happen. And um, yeah, we were t we were literally a week away from going and we postponed. So um, how are we doing? I, I don't, you know, I, I, I text a little bit with the guys. Obviously we don't see anybody because we stay, you know, we're staying, you know, socially distanced and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, it's like, it's, it, this is a, an immense, dark cloud that will clear at some point but it ain't going to be anytime soon and i'm not trying to be negative nelly because i'm usually a uh, positive poly um about mm -hmm. things um i don't know i just you know it's 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 tough it's going to be it's going to be a tough time um you know it's funny is when covid hit and everything got locked down i remember because i have a dr little drum room that i can access and go to anytime where all my stuff's at I remember I went to it like on that Friday and then maybe that Saturday that happened. It was like so weird out there because all of the businesses were closed. It was so quiet in this industrial area. And it's like, I didn't even want to be there. And then I, then I went shopping once and I had to have gloves on and a mask but for the first time and just saw people looking at people. And it was just like, it was, I couldn't get out of the place quick enough and didn't mm -hmm. ever want to go back. So I stayed home. For, for like eight or 10 weeks until it recently slightly opened up a little bit more. And, um, but I just watched my friends on, on YouTube and, and Instagram live and this and that, and everybody was like being so proactive and everybody was being so, um, so um, working out like crazy and, 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 oh, here's a drum video and here's a song we wrote and I'm going to do a concert from the couch. And I just, I, I, sat there because I, like I said, I was like literally a week from a month tour and you're, you're mentally prepared and all this and it just stopped. And then you don't know, you don't know what's happening. You don't know what's happening with, um, is it going to be two weeks? Cause they originally said, Oh, in two weeks, it's going to be whatever. And then it was two more weeks and two months. And, mm. but I just remember like, I watched all these people do this and I felt so unmotivated and I felt so started, you know, you know, obviously depressed. Um, every time I walked by the refrigerator, oh, oh I better have um, yep. a piece of cheese. Oh, uh, oh, I'm walking by the cover. Oh, I better have some cereal. I can have cereal at 7:30 at night. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> no, I definitely um, know oh, what you mean. Uh, oh, there's, there's, oh, 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 gosh, you know, it'd be really great after this. The cereal is some chips and salsa. That sounds great. And 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 then I go back to watching everybody doing it. I was just like, it was, it threw me for a loop, but. When it did open up again, my wife had been working from home. Oh, and that's the other thing too is I, it took me uh, 67 days to get unemployment, get recognized for unemployment, which for me as an independent contractor is $167 a week mm -hmm. plus the 600 at the time, whatever. But now I'm getting $167 a week unemployment. Even though, even though my bra I could be the top of the bracket, 450, but they don't know how to under uh, acknowledge because I don't yeah. work for anybody but myself. So I mean, they don't know how to understand that um, in the in in the in the system, um, whatever uh, to 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 pay you out properly. Anyways, so once this thing opened up a little bit again, a few a few like a month ago, I started going to mates and started playing drums started working on some drums, started whatever for a few hours you get out of my, my wife's um, hair working at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd go away for a few hours, grab an order a coffee online. That's the other thing. Now you order, you order a coffee and it's no paper. It's just all through the app and then they bring it out to you. And it just became semi-normal. So that's what I've been doing. I started walking in my neighborhood again, which I like to do. I have a, like a nine mile hike through the neighborhood in the hills here um, that I enjoy doing. Um, and then uh, just have a routine. And then, and then I've got a few things, you know, I've got this, this thing with Matt today and, and uh, whatever. And, um, but yeah, it's just, um, it's just, it's weird. So it's weird. I mean, it's weird. And it's going to be longer than anybody's expecting. Now we have an election and that's going to be crazy. And um, so yeah. I don't know, I'm just kind of taking it day by day. I, I, uh, I know you asked me to do this a while ago and I was doing a, a, a podcast with 
with a friend of mine. I was just so like burnt from doing that for like a few months that I just needed some time to clear my, my plate and, and, uh, mm-hmm. do, do that. And that was something to do every day too. Is that my oh, so you were doing a podcast, podcast with someone else? Well, I was, I, I, my friend has a show, uh, a morning, uh, YouTube live show and it's about, you know, whatever, everything and nothing at the same time. Um, and, um, <laughs> But, uh, but I did that every day for like two or three or four months and Monday through Friday. And I, so I was just so burnt. That's why I just needed a break and uh, from doing all this stuff and whatever. But It can get burned out so, even with this. Yeah, even with once a yeah. week, it can get kind of burned, <laughs> burned out from doing yeah, it. Yeah, you know? it's, it's hard to have content. And, you know, it's funny as my friend said, um, you know, yo, you're just leaving and you're going to do your own show. I don't want to do a show. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't think anything that I, I do is interesting. But I'm, I'm glad that you think that it's interesting. You know what yeah. I mean? I just do it. You know what I mean? Like I said, once in a while I look at the wall and I go, Oh God, yeah, I did that. That's cool. Okay. Great. I did that. That was great. But like I said, it's, it's the next thing. It's going to be the next whatever thing I can do. And today it's, ever... it's doing the save the stages with Billy Gibbons and Matt Sorum and Macy Gray, you know? So, and then Tiger yeah. Army, hopefully, um, uh, will, will tour when everything starts touring again. I mean, I've seen, People are doing concerts at uh, drive-in movie theaters. And then when you get an encore, it's called a honk core. And, that, and that's weird. So everybody's <laughs> streaming. Weird. So the streaming thing's going to happen. So, But there's nothing like going and enjoying music and being in a slam pit or a, a dance pit or a just sit and chill pit or stand and chill, chill pit or whatever. Yeah. That's the thing. So I think the vaccine's got to come so we can get back to normal. It's, and when it comes back, it's still going to be semi-normal. Or it's going to be the new semi-new normal. I don't know. It's just weird, but, but it's just, I think that the hardest thing for me was finding a new routine. I've sort of gotten a new routine back a little bit and, um, and, uh, and I'm doing it and I'm, and I'm passionate. Like I love drums. I'm still looking at everybody. Like somebody posts a picture and it's like, Oh, wait a minute. How did they mount that splash symbol? What? I've never seen that. I'll blow the, and I'll, I'm still passionate about it. I'm still seeking drums and making drums, like fixing the drums for Matt yesterday uh, mm-hmm. with the buzzing of the, the springs and the, and the lugs and taking that time. And now I know I have another kid I have to do. So it's something to do. So yeah. Um, it's for Tiger Army, nothing now and anything musical, nothing. I play with a friend, John Gregory band, and he's like a singer songwriter guy. We get together on Sunday mornings, Saturday mornings from 10 to noon and we write songs in his garage and we work on stuff. So that stuff. And he's great. And that's something we need to eventually record at some time when it's safe. Um, we have a mm-hmm. bunch of songs, um, but I'm still, you know, I'm still working on, I'm still playing. I'm still working on stuff in, in the room, whether I sit for five minutes or five hours in my drum room, depending on if I'm inspired. And if I'm not, I walk down the hall, I pull a drum out and I start working on it. So and mm-hmm. fixing it, but that's about, you know, that's really, that's kind of it for now. There's, there is nothing. There is not, we did, we did postpone, the dates and eventually canceled them. We also, right after we, we had rescheduled those dates for the fall, but that's not going to happen. We never announced that for now. There's no point in booking a 2021 show because mm-hmm. who's to say 2021 is going to even happen. That's six months from now. So, and then you postpone it again and then eventually you have to cancel it. So it's, it's whatever, but what's sure terrible people get pissy is clubs eventually. Are, yeah. Right. What's terrible that's- is clubs and stuff are going away. Uh, because they can't survive the coronavirus. And it's going to be that much harder to, to book gigs. That's why we had rescheduled our tour, but not announced it for the fall as soon as we could to have those dates. But some of those clubs are gone now. Now, now that, that's not happening. So anyways, this thing today with Billy Gibbons and Sorum um, is to save the clubs and, and make awareness. Okay. And, you know, there's some great places that we have to try to keep and, and save. So, um, yeah. but yeah, so... I would just say to anybody, try to create a new routine, um, whatever that is. Um, uh, try to, if, if you're feeling stuck, like I was for 10 weeks, create a new path. Um, and the creativity and the, and the inspiration will come and you'll feel like doing something again. And that'll cool. get you out of the hole because I was in the hole for a while. And I, and I would, I would tell people, I'm not going to lie I, I, to, to them. I said, I just, I'm, I'm stuck. I just don't not happy. I don't know what to do. And eventually I got myself out of it. And that's, you know, I wasn't going to go jump off a bridge or anything, but I'm just, it's just like, um, but I started making my own way again. Like I feel like rock artists and rock musicians in general, 
don't like to kind of dip their toes into social media. And I, and I think that like hip hop and rap and everything else is just in and pop are just enjoying the bounties of social media right now. And, and it's kind of cool to see because of COVID that a lot of these artists are like getting a lot more into that. I saw Jim from Jimmy Eat World doing like interviews with Mark Hoppus and other stuff like that. And, you know, just, just a lot of online content going, going through there. And so my last, my kind of last question to you is like the whole, the whole point of this podcast when I started it in January was this is going to be like a journal of me starting a record label. Like I stopped, I stopped engineering for the most part um, because I was just, I was just getting calls from like passion projects that were just, I couldn't handle it anymore. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I wanted to like work with artists that I was, that I was really into and that I really kind of wanted to, you know, to make sure that they succeeded so we could see succeed together. So anyway, I starting at the beginning of the year, I wanted to do this record label and I had an idea for it. And part of the idea was it needs to be a lot more content, a lot more like where it's like video content, a lot of YouTube stuff to where, you know, the fun videos, songwriting videos, studio tour videos, things like that. And you can monetize it a billion different ways. I've got a giant list here and I'm not even going to go through it. But I don't know if you have watched any, a lot of YouTube videos online, but there's some successful channels that are kind of almost like, like TV networks. Yeah. And I kind of wanted to do that with a record label. Sure. And so uh, as someone who's been through a, probably a billion things like that, what do you think of that kind of an idea now? And how do you think rock artists would take it? Well, COVID's level, leveled the playing field and made everybody more human. First of all, Jimmy from Jimmy World is just a guy, okay? Mm -hmm. And and I'm not even I'm not even pointing my finger at him because I don't um, I have nothing um, but great about him. But when you see all of these artists doing stuff from their couch, or or you see um, it, everybody's level it's leveled it i mean mm -hmm. you're the same we're the same as jimmy from jimmy world now and we're nobody he's somebody right mm -hmm. or or whoever everybody's doing something from the rock world to the hip-hop world to the jazz fusion world to the whatever i mean that was the whole thing and that, that that's another thing that sort of paralyzed me my friend my friend stefan the show i was doing with him was called coffee talk with the Dika. it was his thing his show um he wanted to do something. He went from 38 subscribers to a thousand within like maybe six weeks. And then a thousand went to 2000 and he's built mm -hmm. his thing up and he does this thing and it's amazing. And, and he's generating, um, Patreon money, which is something and all this stuff and, and, uh, super chat money and, and does the thing live Monday through Friday and has different guests or sometimes has no guests. And he could do the thing by himself or with people around him. So, if he can do it, anybody can do it. And if you're specializing, like he's specializing sort of in a morning talk show, and if you're specializing like this is a label thing, do it. I mean, you're doing it. I mean, you've got, we're over an hour now, so you've bought in Zoom Pro. You've subscribed <laughs> to it, correct? Yes, so, I do. Um, so anybody can do it. That's, everybody has a platform. Even prior to COVID-19, um, everybody had a platform because you can go to an Instagram live or a Facebook live or a now YouTube live or whatever. So yes, do it. Like, um, I have no desire to do it. I, it's great to have somebody be interested in something that I've done, which is you. And I appreciate being on your show. Um, but, um, uh, I, I think that's a great, if you can, if you can sort of not overthink it, but have a plan of how you sort of want to do it more record label style, uh, kind of, pod talk interaction with artists and behind the scenes guy, whatever. Um, I mean, that, I think that's great. I think more people should do it. This is now is your platform, but you've got to also understand everybody has a platform and mm -hmm. how much time do you, do you, uh, do you have to, um, to, of their attention? Do you know what yeah. I mean? So you have to be, thoughtful in your guests and, and how long your show is and how, you know, how you want to break it up or how you want to do it or what you want to say. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I, I wish we didn't have a landline. I never answer. I don't even care. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think it's great. I think what you're doing is great. And, and, uh, and it'll be great to, to go back and, and see some of the stuff that 
some of your pods that you've done, your early pods on, and maybe you can send me some some of your favorite ones that I can kind of have a have sure. a look. A needle drop, as my friend says, needle drop through and, and see what's going on. And then you know, yeah. so it's funny is like I I did look for a few things because I wanted to see what it was going to be like and if there was a co-host or co-hosts, um, and um, I didn't see anything because it was a quick look. Um, but you know, it's funny is as with bands when I work with them. For example, the first time I worked with with a band like Shinedown, I didn't go back and listen to anything. I just knew I was getting hired for a reason. I knew it was whatever. I think the only thing I wanted to make sure of the drummer wasn't left-handed, so I didn't wait set the drums up right-handed, then have to reset them because you left. That's the old joke. But I don't even I don't even sometimes listen to the stuff that I've done in the, you know, if it's obviously something I'm, you know, I'll listen just to reference see how it ultimately came out. But I'll listen to it one time and then that's it. But, um, but when I'm working with bands, I just, I know that I know I have a source. I know I have a vibe. I know I have a, of a thing. I know I have options and from talking and whatever, but I don't want to hear what somebody else did because it might be yeah. over-processed. It might be super lo-fi. It might be whatever. And I don't want that to tinge anything that I've got going already. So, um, so I never looked into your thing. Now I want to, I'd like, you should send me a couple of your favorite shows that I can sure. watch, but, um, but, but also this has, if you, this isn't necessarily label record label oriented. You just, we're talking about some of the stuff I did in the business and whatever yeah. making records, but you're talking about specifically working with the artist that you care about passion about. And that's super important because if you're into it, then it's not really work. And if they're on the same page, then you guys are working for a common goal and that's great. And, and you've already got your format because you've got your show and you've got your, zoom uh pro account and uh <laughs> you had me on a slow news day ah so. oh man i was super excited to talk to you again it's been a very very long time and i i appreciate you know all the info and you know taking some time out of your day especially since you got some other stuff going on today it seems a lot more important than me <laughs> you know what's funny about me is like i knew about this gig for five days and i've been working on it for five days already like set the drums up make sure it's right because you know Matt Sorum was my first guy I ever worked for, and he was the toughest guy to ever work for. So I still, 20 years later, um, worried that he's not going to like what I'm doing. You never <laughs> know so what weird. match you're going to get sometimes. You know, he says everything's cool, and then something's not cool, and you have to be able to accommodate. But that's mm -hmm. my job. You know, it, it, that's, that's what I'm, I'm there for is to make him happy. So, and I say that, you know, whatever, but yeah, he was, the, he was the toughest, one of the toughest to work for. So, um, because he's like a big brother. So when you have that relationship, um, you can be tougher on uh, each other. It's tough. Yeah, it's tough. So he's the big brother I always wanted, but never had. So, yeah. And, and he, 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 Matt and Jerry really changed my life, you know?